And all God's people said, amen indeed. Hey, we are delighted this morning to have David Hills with us uh, as our guest speaker. He is the executive director of the Michiana Biblical Counseling Center, uh, and I'm going to introduce him in just a moment. Uh, but I want to let you know, Trinity has had a long-standing, uh, informal relationship with Michiana Biblical Coun Counseling Center, MBCC. Uh, they have been one of several Christian ministries that we have recommended to people. And in recent years, we have just heard from many of our folks here in the Trinity family who have been helped by MBCC. So I'm pleased to share with you today that beginning this month, Trinity will become a formal ministry partner with MBCC. So we're going to include financial support in that, and we're just really excited to formalize what's been a longstanding relationship. Uh, so it's really a double delight to have you with us here this morning, David. Dave served in pastoral ministry for 26 years prior to serving as executive director uh, for MBCC. As an adult discipleship pastor for the latter 15 years of that time, his passion for biblical counseling just grew. Uh, and that really led to the launch of MBCC in 2015. It's an independent biblical counseling center. It serves the entire Michiana area. And so we're really excited to uh, just sharing what God's doing there, and especially to hear from God's word this morning through David. Uh, before he comes to share with us, uh, let's take a look at why MBC's ministry is so, so important and vital. There are seasons in our life when relationships break down, destructive habits take control of us, we're overwhelmed with emotions looking for hope. Jesus understands our struggles, temptations, and sorrows. He came to save us and teach us how to live in this difficult world. That's why Michiana Biblical Counseling Center cares for hurting people with hope from God's Word, where we find powerful help to face our challenges, learning how to live in a way that's for our good and His glory. Visit MichianaBCC.org to learn more about our affordable counseling and compassionate care. Well, good morning. It's good to be here. I'm Dave Hills, and as was mentioned, I have had the privilege of serving as the executive director of Michiana Biblical Counseling Center since 2015. It's based in Osceola, Indiana, and for our entire time, we have been located in Osceola Grace Church. They've provided that space free of charge to us for that entire nine years, and we've been, as we've been growing, they've just been giving us more space, and we're so thankful for the privilege of having that location to work out of. Well, at MBCC, we have the wonderful opportunity to take this book and its life-changing principles and truths and minister those in the lives of people. As we do, we have people come with all kinds of situations that they're dealing with. People who are grieving over loss and broken relationships. People who have been hurt and abused by others. People struggling with fear, anxiety, and depression. People who are entangled in destructive habits that are hurting themselves and other people. People who have broken the trust of those they love most or people whose trust has been broken by the person that they love. People come to us simply looking for help to make sense of this world in which we're living in and it's becoming harder to understand each and every day, isn't it? Well, over the past nine years, God has blessed our ministry. Many people have come to faith in Jesus Christ. Hearts and lives have been changed. Relationships have been restored. People have been equipped to counsel. And God has grown our ministry. Just last year, our wonderful counseling staff at MBCC had the opportunity to hold 2,400 sessions with individuals, couples, and families seeking help with whatever they were going through. 
that just tells you the overwhelming needs that exist in our community. And it's our privilege as a counseling center to meet just a fraction of those needs. Well, before we go to God's word, I want to just pray and thank God for this opportunity and for you wonderful people who have gathered here. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this privilege you've given me to open up your word, share from my heart what you are doing and what you can do in people's lives. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your goodness. Thank you that you call us into a relationship with you and for all you do in that relationship. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Well, in the summer of 1985, my wife Sue and I loaded up all of our earthly possessions into a moving van to move from Cedar Falls, Iowa to Winona Lake, Indiana. And the reason we were making that trip and it was because we were going to be settling in Winona Lake so that I could train for pastoral ministry. That first year of seminary was fairly challenging because I was a pre-med major in college, and there's a slight difference between pre-med and theological training. So it was a little difficult, but it was fairly uneventful at the same time. But that all changed in the summer between my first and second years when I received a phone call that rocked the world of the, this 27-year-old person at the time. I'm not 27 anymore, in case you're wondering. One evening that summer, my mother, Ruth Hills, she called to let me know that her doctor had discovered breast cancer. She told me that surgery had been scheduled and that biopsies and lab work would reveal the type of cancer and the extent to which it had spread. So we waited, and in a short time, those results came back, and the news was tough for my entire family to hear. Mom's cancer was an aggressive form of cancer, and it spread throughout her body. That began nearly three years of difficult treatments, frequent setbacks, powerful emotions. I mean, I was a 27-year-old kid looking at losing his mom. And it involved frequent trips back to Iowa to visit my family. On one of those visits home, not long before my mom went to heaven, she looked at me and said, David, <clears throat> would you sing the new 23rd for me? Well, it wasn't really on the top of my list to sing a solo in front of a whole hospital unit, but when a mother who's fighting with cancer asks you for something like that, there's really only one thing you can do. So I swallowed hard and said, sure, Mom, and I began to sing Cliff Richard's contemporary version of Psalm 23 that went something like this. <clears throat> because the Lord is my shepherd... I have everything that I need. He lets me rest in meadows green and leads me beside the quiet stream. He keeps on giving life to me, and he helps me to do what honors him the most. Even when walking through the dark valley of death, the valley of death, I will never be afraid, for he is close beside me, guarding, guiding all the way. He spreads a feast before me. In the presence of my enemies, he welcomes me as his special guest. With blessings overflowing, his goodness and unfailing kindness shall be with me all of my life. And afterwards, I will live with him forever and ever in his home. Forever in his home. As I look back at that special moment in that hospital room, I believe it served two very important purposes. The obvious one, it was an opportunity for my, me to comfort and minister to my mother. She wanted to be reminded of the truths of God's care, his power, his provision, and his promises. But it was also an opportunity for my mother, whether it was intentional or not, I don't know, to minister to me by reminding me of some important truths. Truths about God's presence, his promises, his power, and his provision. 
As we look at the scriptures this morning, I want you to turn to 2 Peter 1. And while you're turning there, I want to give you a little background to this book and why Peter wrote it. Like my mother in her hospital room, Peter knew that he was not going to be around much longer. His time on earth was coming to an end. Not because of terminal illness, but because of the persecution of believers that was taking place at that time. And Peter was an outspoken apostle who spoke the name of Jesus Christ, and he had a target on his back. In his letter, Peter repeatedly made it clear that he was writing to remind his readers of things that were very important, things they should never forget. Things to remember and treasure long after he was gone. We read that heartbeat in 1 Peter 1, verses 13 through 15. I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, after I'm gone, after I'm gone, you may be able at any time to recall these things. And we have First and Second Peter in our hands to remind us of those same important truths that Peter didn't want his readers to forget. Truths we shouldn't forget either. So today we're going to look at just four verses, 2 Peter 1, 1 through 4. And we're going to learn some of those very important truths and realities that Peter did not want his readers to forget. And those readers include you and me. So let's read 2 Peter 1, 1 through 4. Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. His divine power is granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. In essence, if you were to summarize these four verses, it could be summarized in one statement. Church, I want to remind you that through Jesus, you have everything you need to grow in Christ-likeness as you wait for his promised return, everything. So this morning, we're going to examine this passage, and we're going to look at four foundational realities that Peter wanted to make sure that his readers would never forget. Let's look at the first thing he didn't want them to forget. Don't forget your precious faith. Don't forget your precious faith. 2 Peter 1.1 1, 1 again says, Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. What makes our faith precious? Let's consider three reasons why our faith is pre precious. Our faith is precious because of what it took to obtain it. That incredible, amazing, unmerited right standing before God didn't come to us because of anything amazing that we did. Our faith was obtained through the precious blood of our righteous God and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Paul's, or Peter's previous letter in the first chapter, he said these words. You were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Our faith is precious because it was obtained through the precious blood 
of Jesus Christ. And we're going to celebrate his resurrection in just three weeks. Our faith is also precious because it is in no way inferior to the faith of other people. In verse 1, Peter said that he was writing to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours. With those words, Peter was powerfully saying, your faith and my faith is just as precious as the faith through which the earliest and closest followers of Jesus Christ, including Peter, were saved. Because of that, we all stand as equals at the foot of the cross, all of us depending on him. In a world where co comparisons are commonplace, it's important to know that when it comes to faith, God doesn't give to some first-class faith and to others coach faith. He gives us faith that's equal for all, that same precious faith. Our ability to stand before God someday as ransomed, rescued, and redeemed people depends entirely on the righteousness of God and Jesus Christ. Jesus alone has navigated life in this world without failing or falling. Jesus alone can and did make atonement for sin, and Jesus alone can someday bring us home to be with him. Our faith is also precious because it allows us to stand fast and firmly fixed by God's grace. At Michiana Biblical Counseling Center, we often meet with people who are very discouraged. Very discouraged because they've fallen and they've failed repeatedly. The good news is that God allows us to get up and move forward in a new direction. We only have to look at the person of Peter to see that that's true. Peter knew what it was like to fail and fall. Just consider these words. You don't need to turn there, but in Matthew 26, Jesus is speaking to his disciples right before he was going to be betrayed. And he said these words to his disciples. You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Peter stepped up and boldly answered him, Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus looked at Peter and said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Forty verses later in Matthew 26, we hear that, that those words of Jesus came true. Then Peter began to invoke a curse on himself and swear, I do not know the man. I do not know Jesus. And immediately the rooster crowed, and Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out, and he wept bitterly. Peter knew what it was like to fall. He knew what it was like to fail. But he also knew what it was like to get back up again by God's grace. In that same conversation Jesus had with his disciples before his betrayal, he had Peter talking to him on the side alone, and he said to him, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to have you that he might, not, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Jesus was plainly telling Peter that he would fail. But he then said to Peter that he would be strengthened by God's grace to get back up, to go in a different direction. And when he did, he was to strengthen his brothers. By God's grace, that's exactly what Peter did. 
he lived out Jesus' instructions. After falling and failing, he got back up. He turned and gave his life to strengthening his brothers and sisters. And that's what 2 Peter is all about. Throughout this book, he's living out those instructions from Jesus. He's seeking to strengthen his brothers and sisters so they would stand fast, firmly fixed in the faith. So what does that mean to us? It means that the same faith that transformed Peter and enabled him to get back up, it's ours as well. It's ours as well. Isn't that encouraging? Just like Peter, we will fall and we will fail, sometimes repeatedly. But when we do, he enables to us to get back up, to turn, to live differently, and ultimately to strengthen others to do the same. That's the privilege I have at Michiana Biblical Counseling Center. This man up here falls and fails. Just ask my wife, ask my kids, ask anybody who knows me. But God allows me to get back up by the grace of God and to strengthen others with the strength, same strength that I've received. Well, a second don't forget from Peter, don't forget the grace of knowing God. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. This is verse 2 of chapter 1. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Here's some important truths to know about knowing God. The grace of knowing God is an incredible gift given to us by God himself. The simple truth is that God wasn't obligated to make himself known to us. But he graciously and freely chose to make himself known to those who believe. And the knowledge of God that he has made possible isn't a di distant, limited knowledge. No, the knowledge that's talked about in verses 2 and 3 of this passage, the knowledge that's referred to, is a deep, intimate, personal and life-transforming knowledge of God. It's not an I know of God relationship. It's an I know the Most High God personally and intimately relationship. And He knows me. And He loves me. That's grace. Another truth about knowing God, knowing God is our greatest purpose and privilege in life. There's nothing more important or precious than that. You and I were created to know God. We were created to live in a loving relationship with Him, but sin separated us from Him. Because of God's love for us, our knowledge of God can begin when we enter into a relationship with God through saving faith in Jesus Christ. That's salvation. Spoken of in John 17, 3. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. But salvation is just the beginning of knowing God. As we grow in our knowledge of God, He transforms us to become increasingly like His Son, Jesus Christ. A third truth about knowing God, the grace of knowing God, the grace of knowing God came at a great price. Consider the words of Romans 5, 6 through 8. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. While God designed us to have an intimate relationship with him, we all turned our backs, breaking that relationship with our holy God. As a result, we were alienated from him. And we could do nothing to fix that broken relationship. Any attempts on our part to try to fix it would just make it worse. So in order for our relationship with God to be fixed, a relationship we had broken but couldn't fix ourselves, 
God acted on our behalf. Just think of this. God graciously sent his son, his perfect son, to pay the penalty for our sins so we could once again have the opportunity to have a relationship with him. In that mind-numbing, we caused the problem. He provided the solution at great cost to himself. Finally, the grace of knowing God brings great peace. Peace with God, peace within, and peace with others. The grace of knowing God. Third thing, don't forget the power of God at work in you. This is such an incredibly powerful statement. 2 Peter 1.3, His divine power is granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence. What kind of power is it work in believers? It's a power that's life-altering. Through Christ, we've been given everything we need for life and godliness. As we look at verse 3, it's important to define a couple terms in that verse. Life and godliness. Life in this context speaks of possessing the life that God created us to have. A life in relationship with Him. Dead to sin, alive to Christ. We've passed from death to life. That's what God gives us. R.C. Sproul says, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if you have an inclination toward the things of God, at some point in your life, you encountered the touch of the divine in your soul. That inclination did not come from your bosom. It came from the Spirit of God, divine power through the knowledge of the one who called us, and he called us by his glory, by his majestic power, by his righteous activity, he made us alive. So that's life. Godliness is living a life of wisdom. And if you merge those two together, because of my new life in Christ, because of your new life in Christ, I have a life of wisdom. Said another way, I live a life of wisdom. Said another way, godliness or walking in wisdom is the practical and natural outworking of my new life in Christ. But it's a power that goes way beyond just life-altering. That's an understatement. It's a power that's immense. Just how immense? Ephesians 1, 19 through 20 describes God's power at work in us in these terms. Immeasurably great. Immeasurably great. So great it cannot be measured given to all who believe, not just some who believe, but all who believe. It's described as the same power that was required to raise Jesus from the dead and seat him at the right hand of the Father. It's a life-altering power because it's an immense power. And because it's an immense life-altering power, it's a power that leaves us without any excuses. God doesn't save us and then say, hey, I saved you, now knock yourself out trying to live the right way. He doesn't do that. He doesn't say, I've done my part, now you do yours. No, in giving us his immense life-altering divine power, he's given us everything we need for life and godliness. And what does everything mean? One author has said, there isn't anything outside of everything. There isn't anything outside of everything. It's all there. Nothing's missing. And it's a power that's fueled by our knowledge of our, God, our good and glorious God. The power we experience in our lives is directly related to the time we invest in growing in our knowledge of God in spending time with him. So I ask you this question. Are you experiencing God's power in your life? I hope the answer is yes. 
If not, I'd like you to consider another question. What am I doing to grow in my knowledge of my good and glorious God so that I can experience his power to the full extent in my life? Final, don't forget, don't forget God's good, God's great and precious promises. I'll start reading again in 2 Peter 1, 3, which I just read, and move into verse 4. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. I'm just going to talk about some promises that we have been given by our God, some that have already been talked about this morning. God's precious and very great promises tell us that we are partakers of the divine nature, meaning that if we are in Christ, God the Holy Spirit has taken up residence in us. We take we, take, we partake in the very presence of God in our souls. Isn't that an amazing thought? God lives within me. That's powerful. God's precious and very great promises assure us that when God saves us, we begin the journey of growing in Christ's likeness, and God is actively involved in that process. Philippians 1 6 says this being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. As, you lo as long as you walk on this earth, if you are a believer in Christ, Jesus is daily conforming you to the image of Christ. He's working in your heart and your life to transform you. God's precious and very great promises assure us that we will ultimately look like Christ in the way God fully intended. God's precious and very great promises tell us that while we're not currently free from the presence of sin, we are no longer slaves to sin. They also tell us that one day we will be free from the presence of sin when we spend eternity with our good and glorious and excellent God. Finally, God's precious and very great promises tell us that we have everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him. Nothing is missing. I just want to ask a question. How many of you have ever given a gift to a child at Christmas only to discover as they were opening up the gift, unwrapping the gift, that on the side of the box there were three fatal words, Batteries not included. Your excitement turns into terror. Your child's excitement turns into tears. That very cool present is currently a useless piece of junk without batteries. That wonderful Christmas was ruined because of the loss of batteries. That never happens with God in our salvation. When he adopts us as his children and gives us the gift of salvation, he provides us with everything we need to experience true life, to live in a way that reflects his character on our road to sanctification and arrive safely at our glorification where we will look like Jesus Christ in the way God intended fully for us to look. No believer can truthfully claim that they do not have what is required to live as God intended and grow in God's grace. So let's never forget the precious faith we've been given through our right, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Never forget the grace of knowing God personally and intimately. Never forget that we've been given the life-altering power of God through the indwelling Holy Spirit. Never forget that we've been given countless great, precious promises. Throughout this passage that we've looked at, we've seen that knowing God and his promises is the key to life and godliness. 
The only way we can truly know God and his promises is by immersing ourselves in his word and learning from him. So let me close with this thought. If God sent you a letter every day in the mail, and you went to the mailbox and you saw your name on the front of the envelope in the center being God himself, would you throw it away? Would you leave it in the mailbox? Or leave it on the counter in your house to collect dust? Or would you instead read it repeatedly until you knew every word and every nuance of every word in that letter because you were receiving communication about God from God himself. God has indeed communicated with us through this letter, his word. So let's make it our aim to listen to him, to learn from him, and to live for him as he's called and enabled us to do. And let's seek out to live the challenge that Peter gives in the very last verse of 2 Peter, where he says these words, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. I just want to personally thank you for calling me your child and giving me everything I need for life and godliness. And I thank you that that's true for everyone who's called on the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that as we go from here, we will be faithful students of our good and glorious God. In Christ's name I pray, amen. And everyone said indeed, amen. David, thank you so much for opening God's word with us thank this morning. We want to pray with you and for you, uh, for MBCC. Can we do that together? Heavenly Father, our hearts just echo what's just been prayed, that we are so grateful for your word, your great and precious promises to give us encouragement and hope. Thank you that you have given us everything we need for life and for godliness. Lord, we thank you for your servant, David, for the team there at MBCC. Lord, continue to use them to speak truth and grace into people's lives. Lord, we pray your blessing on the ministry. Continue to grow it, supply all its needs, equip it for all that you've called it to do. Lord, we pray for wisdom that you'd give David uh, day by day in leading the team, discerning next steps. Lord, raise up other churches like Trinity to be partners that together we can see hope and healing come to folks who can know you and love you and ultimately share the hope that we have in you. Lord, to that end, be glorified and continue to do your work among us and among MBC through your word. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen.